So we are 30 miles north of Joplin. Um, put it in context, uh, we are in Southwest Missouri. We are in the Rocky Hills of Missouri. We farm around 880 acres of row crop, 128 acres of pasture. Uh, we are 100% uh, no-till, 100% cover crop land. We integrate cattle on most of our on our, most of our row crop land as well. So my husband Scott and I um, actually purchased this farm just north of St. Catherine in 2015. Um, so it's very much a work in progress. We've got um, hair sheep, cattle, hogs, chickens, goats, <laughs> kind of the whole menagerie. We've got a mix of cool season um, grass and legume on most of the farm. And then we also, on part of the farm, we did a mix of warm season um, native grass. This is a third generation farm that my grandpa, he bought this place in 1950. It was a continuous corn and soy farm up until about four years ago. Um, and then we used our um, knowledge and information about cover crops, annual forages, um, to transition into a sheep and uh, cattle operation in which we've just started to direct market and uh, grass finished beef and lamb. Look back over my shoulder um, it's, it's this beautiful iconic hillside. Um, there's 30 acres of chestnut trees that are planted that we'll be able to harvest eventually but we want to create it. We want to create a space here where people can come and find rest and find peace um, and find joy but at the same time it can also be a working farm. Earth Dance is an organic farm school started in 2008 right here in Ferguson, Missouri. We grow a huge variety of food here, everything from uh, heirloom vegetables to fruits, lots of perennials, herbs, and we even have some chickens. We're in Southwest Missouri, uh, halfway between Springfield and Joplin. Uh, our operation uh, is about 50% row crops, irrigated row crops, and 50% uh, rangeland. In the early 2000s, we pretty much converted our whole operation to uh, no-till on early crop, double crop, and, and everything. There are several things that we really care about here. Um, so first of all, we want to make sure that there's a living root in the ground at all times. Um, we feel like we can capture sunlight almost all year round. Um, and we can also infiltrate water. Like that's uh, probably the driving force. That's why actually a part of the reason why we ended up moving into sheep as well. It just provides us with these big windows to have big diverse um, grasses and forbs. You know, a big part of the regenerative ag movement is how do we capture sunlight. Um, it's also how do we eliminate things that are gonna destroy soil and release carbon, right? And so, so cover crops led us to capturing sunlight. Um, and then, but then we also had to eliminate tillage because we didn't want to release that same, like that same carbon that we were, that we were sequestering. And so it's, it's those, it's like that twin movement. It's no till and having, uh, having a living root in the ground as much as we can, like that really drives everything that we try to do. We are fully committed to the system. No till, 100% covered. And really on my farm, you know, what we try to focus on the principles of soil health. Um, we just believe that the soil and, and the plants can fix what we need. We're 100% no-till. We have no tillage equipment, so we're pretty aggressive when it comes to minimizing disturbance. Our first step was reduce tillage and no-till. The immediate effect was less erosion. Another effect was a little better soil structure, you know. And then the cover crop, basically, that we saw that as enhancement of even less erosion and even improve soil structure and better water intake rates, a little bit healthier plants and everything. And the years where we had a really good cover crop, uh, where we in, let the, had a good grazing season on it, it seemed like those years, the whole year, that field benefited uh, from uh, increased water infiltration, uh, more resistance to compaction, you know, from it, it, the soil just, it was livelier and it, it, it uh, the structure just was, was there. And I watched our fields when dry spells would happen and we would always start showing uh, ill effects of the drought later than conventionally tilled fields. So we might go three months without rain, but our crops look just fine. Our pastures look just fine. We don't have to supplement hay to our cattle. Our, our crops are resilient. In 2018, you know, we went three months without rain in the summertime, 
and the corn still made 160 bushel, which was a success off of 80 units of nitrogen. Tillage is a great thing at making nutrients available, right? But what does it cause? It causes so many other issues, right? We have runoff, the soil gets then compacted because it's bare. Um, we have we, we don't have as early seedling beaker when, the, when we get those hard packing rains. We get cracks on our ground, which are all unnatural. We should not see those. You've got to put a dollar value on the, that dirt that goes down the ditch. You know, if you, if you ignore that, you're ignoring a pretty fundamental part of the equation, in my opinion. It may not ding you this year or next year, but building soil is building organic matter. That's how, that's how all these soils developed. And it's, it's amazing how we can do that. The roots exude certain glues and, and uh, compounds that affect the way the soil works. Well, all this dates back to how the prairies were formed and built soil. They literally built soil and the way they did it was uh, uh, with from a diverse plant mix, and um, the hooved animals, the the herds of bison and wild uh, wildlife, that combination is what made these soils. A big part of integrating livestock for us is. Like, I feel like we're really able to capture the value of the different crops that we grow. If we grow a diverse mix, like, and like that's definitely the best way to take care of soil health, but it's really hard to harvest. It's, it's really hard to then figure out how to make money on that. And the best way that we've found is that we can have like a bunch of little bitty harvesters run into the field um, and they can then take, they can make use of the sunlight. Um, they can take and cycle those nutrients. Um, and then they can leave the ground better than what they find it. They don't only really leave their manure, they also leave the microbes from their saliva, the microbes from the manure, which are also helping to build soil and cycle nutrients. So for those animals, they get, like, they get to eat everything that's there in about the right quantity of what they need for that day. And then they can move on to the next one. That helps us with weeds, um, like that helps us with pasture management, but also at the same time, they get a fresh little slice every day. When we're moving them out of their manure, move, move, moving them to a fresh spot where they get to graze stuff that's always four inches or taller, um, then we don't have to worry about parasite load building up, um, hoof problems. And so like, so the, the, the benefits are multitude. What we use is adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Um, it's not a standard set rotation, so we don't get set on like a rotation, whether that's clockwise or counterclockwise. We're always switching over rotation every year. We also focus more on stock density instead of stocking rate. And that plays a lot of benefits because if you think back, you know, as we, as you know, I'm sure y'all have heard this before with like Lewis and Clark's entries about, you know, the buffalo running across the prairies and how tight knitted they were. Well, then there was long periods of rest. And so with this system here, we will run the cows tighter during certain times of the year and wider other times of year, it's always adaptive. It's always moving because nature's adaptive. It changes every single day, you know, in the split second. So, um, you know, our system is, I think the most based closest to how nature actually functions. If you look at the deer, how they graze, they go and graze an area and that area might be left alone for quite a while. You know, all we really have is a four wheeler, um, some poly wire, electric fence charger, and some water tanks. And that's pretty much all you need to run, you know, to run that system. We rotationally graze everything. Um, and when we first set up the farm in rotational grazing, we only had cattle and um, we've expanded the hair sheep thing very fast. The sheep will eat some of the weeds that the cattle just won't touch. Um, and it's interesting, there's a paddock that we just moved out of this morning that there's still a lot of red clover and white clover left. And if the cattle had been in there, that would have all been gone. <laughs> so it's just interesting to watch because they do graze differently. You know, concurrently in uh, the regenerative uh, activity we've been doing on the uh, row crop ground, we've been rehabbing our prairie soils and, uh, and, uh, and our pastures and forages in general. And what we're seeing when we, when we rehab the native warm season grass fields is the increase in diversity. We're using that diversity idea from what we've seen in the native pastures, that's part of our cover crop strategy is making diverse mixes of plants. Our cover crops are literally the biggest part of our fertility program. On our farm last year, we applied zero P and K on our farm. So we try to focus on the, 
like you know four main groups of plants that we have within a three-year rotation warm season grasses cool season grasses we also like to have warm season broadleaves and cool season broadleaves right and so if we keep all those in that soil microbiome that soil will be healthier and it'll be more resilient to disease and insect pressure we raise cash crops with other crops so like we'll raise barley with lespediza um we'll raise oats with phacelia and turnips and spring peas and and we can actually harvest those and separate those from the combine and have a product to still sell and that really increases you know like i just talked about how healthy the soil is you know and having those different root exudates there one of the big benefits of native grasses um they're going to be hardier and they're going to be more adapted to our environment which is great so you know those grasses are then available when we have the crazy missouri weather you know, whether it's a lot of rain in the spring or super hot temperatures and high humidity in the summer. Um, you know, when you've got those native grasses, they're, they're adapt to that. We spend a lot less on winter hay than we would if we weren't doing this. Um, we have a lot better utilization of our grass all through, this, through the year. Um, and it, it, it's actually saved us a lot of money that we would have been spending in supplements and hay otherwise. We continue to ask, well, how can we make our soil healthier? And as we ask that question, then we have to say, well, how can we have different families of plants in the ground at all times? How can we have perennials like with our chestnut trees? Because like that's the epitome of a no-till, no chemical system is a perennial system, right? And so then we have chestnuts and we have hazelnuts. Um, and we're moving in in those directions too so it's soil health has and will continue to drive us towards those very very integrated holistic systems every time that we allow a crop to actually go to flower and rather than just take it out right away and put something new in we know that there are certain insects that are at the life cycle where they're going to need that pollen and so that's one practice. We also just have a lot of perennial plantings that are primarily for the sake of uh, encouraging pollinators. So interplanted between all of our fruit trees, we have a mix of native perennials that are great at attracting pollinators, um, low growing shrubs and ground covers, and really just kind of mimicking a forest environment, but producing a lot of food for both humans and pollinators. You know, it's just very important that we follow nature's principles. And, and this is nature's template. You know, what we try to mimic on our farm, this is not my idea or anyone else's idea. This is just what nature gave us, you know, with the native prairies or the forest, whatever we use, you know, for biomimicry on our farm, that's what we kind of focus on. The only way to learn about cover crops is to start doing it. And you don't have to do it on the whole farm. The only way to learn about native warm season grasses is to just do it. But there's so many programs that are almost low cost or no cost to try. A buffer strip, a, a corner. You don't have to do the full Monty necessarily to get the, a good effect. You can do bits and pieces and get partially where you want to go. And then you'll see, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. This is, I want, I want these healthy attributes. I want these, um, uh, you know, erosion control uh, uh, systems and uh, everything else. And uh, it, you, you, can, you can achieve them with what we know now. And it's, you, you know, you can just read about it. You can go to seminars. There's all kinds of public discourse going on now how to use these techniques. There are people who have been doing this for 40 years. This is not new. And there have been people who have made all the mistakes before you so that you don't have to. You don't have to have the perfect equipment to do this. You don't have to go out and buy a $200,000 air drill to cover your 2,000 acres. You can use your current interplant planter to plant 15 inch row covers and it'll be just fine. Don't worry about the ideal situation. Don't worry about the ideal equipment. Use what you have and get started. For sure reach out to NRCS and the Equip program um, because they do have some pretty powerful tools that I didn't know existed until we had bought our own farm. Um, and so a, a friend had actually said, hey, you should go talk to them about an equip. And um, there is just a lot of opportunity there to help, to help be able to change something over to a more sustainable system um, through an equip. And so I, I would recommend if you're wanting to do something, sure, go talk to NRCS and, and find out more about what is available.
And it's a learning curve and there's a lot of things that um, you'll come across that you'll need to consult other farmers about. But the fact that we've been doing this for 14 years, that's not forever, but it's, it's long enough to see results and I can say it works. I believe in what we're doing and it's not it's it's proven things it's not it's not out there the only out there is we're just an early adopter there's nothing radical about what we're doing we're, we're wanting to capture more carbon which is going to make our soil uh, organic matter higher which is going to result in more productive soils it's that that simple